And nowadays, I'm mostly writing novels and computer games and uh, pop culture encyclopedias. So for instance, the last two editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia, I wrote both of those. I've written books on Captain America and the Avengers. Uh, I wrote three novels for Halo, which is a Xbox universe for science fiction, uh, first person shooter. Um, I wrote a Star Wars uh, young adult novel for Rogue One. Um, uh, like Yuri said, I've written something about somewhere around 35 different novels and somewhere on the range of two to 300 other books and games. Um, I've honestly lost track a long time ago, but I have a big shelf now, a lot of stuff on it. I did some stints doing toy design, which was kind of fun, doing different stories for toys. I worked on Ghost Recon Wildlands, which was one of the Tom Clancy games that came out a couple years ago. I was a story doctor for Assassin's Creed Origins, uh, which was a best-selling game a couple years ago as well. I got another game coming out here in May that I can't tell you the title of yet, because when you do these kind of things, you sign these things called non-disclosure agreements which means you're not allowed to talk about it until the company talks about it. And if the company never talks about it, you never get to talk about it. So, um, I'm just going to blather for a couple more minutes and I'll take all the questions. Before. Because, uh, actually, let's start now. No. Basically, my pitch on that, though, is that I, I can stand up here and blather because I'm a writer and I write big books. I could blather for hours and hours on any subject you wanted to, whether I knew anything about it or not. I'd figure it out. But one of my superpowers is not mind reading, and I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to so if you have questions, please ask. I was wondering what company. Which company? Oh, for the video game? I can tell you I worked on a project for Avalanche Studios, which is a company in Stockholm, Sweden, that has done things like Just Cause 2, Just Cause, the whole Just Cause line and a whole bunch of other games. Uh, I spent a couple weeks over in Sweden. It hasn't been announced yet, but I'm going to be a guest at a new uh, convention called Nordskin, which is in northern Sweden, like nine hours up towards the, North, the Arctic Circle. Uh, at the end of May, so I'll be up there. I have many, many friends in Sweden. We go out and get uh, wickedly drunk for a week at a time on the show. Yeah, it's a good time. Um, but I started working for them for a company called Target Games in Sweden, which does uh, did the Mutant Chronicles and a bunch of other stuff. They were behind Mutant Year Zero, actually, which is a new game that came out about three, four months ago, I think. And I actually wrote a short story for that that they're supposedly going to publish in a second. So. But I know the, uh, I've known the publisher there for some 30 years. And he's also the guy who owns Coney on that. They bought the entire uh, Robert E. Howard Library, much of which has fallen into the public domain over the years, but uh, they also own the trademarks, and they were just at uh, Marvel Comics yesterday talking to them about how they're integrating Conan into the Avengers and the Marvel Universe. Um, most writers don't have a single job. It's, it's fairly rare to be a full-time novelist or a game designer or a freelance of any kind because, uh, for one, it doesn't come with benefits, right? Uh, for two, it doesn't come with a steady, a steady paycheck, which a lot of people really like. I've been fortunate enough that my wife has been uh, the straight level line throughout our finances, and I've been the one who jumps up and down like this. Uh, you know, when we have great years, it's because I had a great year. When we have years where it's just okay, it's because she was there holding steady. Um, so if you're talking about getting into novels, I know, or, or standard books, the standard way to do it is to write a novel on spec, which means speculation, which means you're taking a shot in the dark. You write that novel and then you shop it around. Most publishing houses nowadays, especially the larger ones, will not look at a novel from somebody who's unpublished. In fact, they will not look at a novel from somebody they don't have a previous relationship with. So the uh, right way to do that then is to find somebody who has a relationship with them. So you look for an agent. An agent is somebody who knows all the editors at all the big houses and knows the kind of things that they're looking for and also knows enough about books and literature and whatever genre you're working in that they can say, this is something I think can really sell, this is gonna be fantastic, we're all gonna make millions of dollars for each other. So they will go through a slush pile, which is basically everybody sending in their stuff to them, and they'll read things out and figure out what they want, think is good, and then they'll ask if they can hire on as your agent. An agent takes 15% of your money for anything they do, for anything they sell for you. If somebody tells you they'll uh, be your agent, but you have to pay them, or you have to pay them to be published, they're scamming you, okay? That's either a vanity publisher which is okay if you know what you're going into. But if they say you need to pay me a reading fee or something like that, don't bother with those people, they're cheating. Okay? The rule of publishing is money should flow toward the right, not away from it. Okay? There's not enough money in this industry as it is that you should be paying to be part of it. You should be getting the money to come toward it. Once you get the agent, and actually I don't have an agent, I've done all my own stuff. Uh, that's because I started out as a uh, in games and such, and toys where I was negotiating six-figure deals and not worrying about it. And because my father is an attorney, 
as well. He taught me a lot about the legalities and the ins and outs of these things. So I'm very comfortable negotiating these things, knowing what kind of rights we're talking about in that. But uh, I never felt the need of uh, paying somebody 15% to do that for me. If you don't have that special, uh, this particularly specialized kind of knowledge, I recommend you get an agent. It's actually really well worth the 15%. Okay. Um, so you get an agent, the agent says, sure, I'm gonna take this and shop this around. They take it to every New York publishing house they can find. Usually there's uh, five top ones nowadays, the five biggest ones in the country, and pretty much the world for the English speaking language. And they see if they can get somebody to bite on that book. If they're really lucky, they'll get two or three or four or five people to bite on that book. And then they get into what's called a bidding war, and then you get a lot of money all at once. Right? That's really rare, though. It's kind of like uh, you know, uh, hitting a home run at your, or a grand slam at your first time at bat. It's just, it could happen, sure, but it just almost never does. Um, but you, that's what you hope your agent's going to be able to do for you. Often what happens is they'll come back and say, I've got an offer from this, uh, this editor over here at this publishing house, and I, I recommend that you take that, and they'll negotiate all, all the details for you about uh, what kind of money you're going to get as an advance, how much you're going to get as a royalty, what other kind of rights you might be giving up if you're giving up film rights, gaming rights, other secondary rights for audio books, foreign languages, all this kind of stuff. And it gets fairly complex very really quickly. And again, this is the reason that an agent is a good idea if you don't already know a lot of this stuff or not willing to basically become your own private lawyer for all this stuff. If you actually have a good idea how to negotiate, you could hire an intellectual property attorney as a flat fee as opposed to a percentage. And they can do that kind of stuff for you. But again, you have to know who to talk to. Yes? What is the best and the worst part of being a working writer? Oh, um, that's a good question. The worst part is actually having to do the writing. <laughs> I actually like doing the right. Uh, uh, I like locking myself in a room for long periods by myself. And that's one thing about a writer is, you know, even though when you see a writer, when you talk to a writer, or you see them do a signing or whatever, or you see them online, uh, they're being personable and presentable and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, 99% of the of a career of a writer is being alone in a room by yourself, focusing on a, on a blank page and filling it up with words, right? And if you enjoy doing that, doing that actual process, then writing is a career you could probably make something of no matter what. If you just want to be, if, well, some people want to be a writer in the sense that they have written something and now they get to do the, the fun parts like going to signings and being famous and blah, 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 blah. But if you really want to have a career as a writer, you should learn how to love the process itself, right? If you enjoy the actual stringing of words together, coming up with neat turns of phrase and plotting out different books and coming up with new characters and all that, if that's something you enjoy, then you can make a career as a writer. No matter what level of success you get to financially, uh, you're going to be somebody who's engaged and entertained about what you're doing every day, right? Um, I don't really know if there are bad things about being a writer. For me personally, I mean, for some people, it would kill them. My, my brother's a carpenter. It would kill him to sit in a room by himself. Uh, he would get antsy and start throwing things at the walls pretty quickly, right? Um, now, on the other hand, if I had to go out on a job site, I'd end up with broken thumbs pretty quickly, I'm sure. So every, everybody's got their own different skill set that they want to do. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it really is just the writing. I enjoy the writing a lot. And uh, if I had nothing to do all day long, I would probably just sit around and do that. Uh, one of the tough parts about being a writer is, is uh, if you do it full time, you're now doing it not just for fun, but to pay your bills. And it's like anything else in the world. For instance, I'm sure a lot of you guys like to read books, but if you actually get assigned a book in class, you kind of hate reading it. Right? As soon as it's something you have to do, it sucks the fun out of it, right? And you have to learn how to get over that. You have to say, well, I, I have to get this done. This is now my job. People are not only paying me this for, for this, but they're going to be making money off this as well. So, for instance, if you're the writer and you don't turn your manuscript in that time, you screwed up your editor schedule and the production schedule and the marketing schedule and the, and the uh, distribution schedule and everything else, all the way down to people selling books to people at the stores. So you need to make sure that if you've agreed to a deadline, you do your best to hit, right? Uh, if you blow a deadline, which happens because hey, you know, life happens, and, you know, people die, there's accidents, you're sick, uh, whatever happens, don't turtle down. Don't refuse to talk to somebody. Don't be afraid of talking to somebody because you're afraid they're going to yell at you. They might yell at you, but you know what? You're an adult and you live through it. Uh, what you need to do is just say, look, I'm sorry, I didn't get this done here. I think I can have it done by then. I hope that's accept acceptable to you. If it's not acceptable to you, then you have to have a hard conversation about what's going to happen at that point. But often they'll say, okay, that's fine. We can read your things around as long as you told me. But if you disappear, the chances are that'll be the last thing you ever write for anybody because 
those editors know all the other editors, and your agent will look at you and say, geez, why am I pushing this person? Who's not going to actually produce anything? And when they do, they go silent. I, I believe it's Neil Gaiman that had advice at a graduation speech that he gave where he mentioned that there's three things that you're supposed to, that there's like a Venn diagram of three things, and that's doing work on time, uh, being easy to work with, and doing quality work. Right, exactly. And you gotta do, I think, two out of three well. If you do two out of three well, you're better than most people, right? Uh, my corollary to that one, I actually have been saying something similar to that uh, for, for a long time. The whole idea is that there's two, two different things about that, right? The one is what Neil says is you have to be uh, good on time or personal, right? right. Now, or, or genius. You have to be either, uh, you know, genius is the good part. So you have to either be a genius, hit your deadlines, or be really wonderful at work. Now, the fact is you don't have any control over whether or not you're a genius. And actually, you don't even have control over whether or not people perceive you as a genius, right? right. You can be really smart. You can do a great, great job writing that book. But you really don't have any control over how the market and the audience actually accepts it, right? A lot of times it's a matter of timing. If Harry Potter had come out 10 years earlier than it did, I don't think it would have sold nearly as well. There are other Wizard Academy books that came out in that period of time. But J.K. Rowling, the right book at the right time, and, and did a fantastic job, not casting aspersions on the work at all. It's amazing. But a lot of it, as far as the audience goes, has to do with timing, right? And you don't have any control over this kind of stuff. If everybody knew how to do this, uh, the people or the agents and the publishers would pick out million dollar bestsellers every time, and obviously that doesn't matter, right? So the two things you can't control in the, that Venn diagram is being on time and being personal. Being a good person to work with is easy to work with. Those are two things that are totally under your control. The rest of it, you just do your best job and hope that it's gonna work out as best you can. So don't count on being a genius, is what I'm saying, okay? Count on being on time and being good and easy to work with. Because those are things that any person can actually achieve on their own without having to worry about outside input from anybody. Now the, the other, the, the flip side of that, the corollary is when you're looking for a job, and when you're starting out, uh, you obviously you can have, you, when your client is talking to you, they'll ask, what is your price? And you say you can have either, you can either have a good, cheap, or fast, right? So if somebody asks you for, when can I get this book done, done by? If it needs to be done in two weeks, that eliminates the, uh, that means you have to have it done fast, and that means that either it's gotta be good or cheap. If you want a shitty book in a week, I can give you a shitty book in a week for cheap. I don't write that one anymore, but people can do that, right? Um, but if you want a good book fast, then it has to be expensive at that point. So at this point in my career, I've been doing this for a while, so I just say the cheap's all the way out the door, and I write good stuff. You know, if you're lucky, I'll get it to you on time, so. Is the goal, oh, I'm sorry, you had a question? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did you get ideas for storytelling? How do I get ideas for storytelling? Yeah, oh, where do you get Ah, uh, that's funny, because, uh, if you're doing this full time, the real question is not how do you get ideas, it's how do you get them to stop, right? Um, coming up with ideas is, very, is not that hard, especially just germs of ideas. Coming up with really good ideas is sometimes the trick, right? And some people do things where they keep like an idea journal and write them all down. And I did that sometimes when I was younger, but I realized I found one that I had lost like 30 years ago. It didn't matter, right? I, I looked through it, I'm like, yeah, none of this makes any sense to me anymore. Um, I find that the really good ideas are ideas that will stick with you, that won't let go. So if, even if you don't write it down, if it's an idea that you know, comes back to you like a week later, and you're like, man, yeah, I really ought to do something. And it comes back to you another week later, or a couple days later. Those are the ideas that stick in your brain and won't get away from you. And you start doing research on them. You start thinking, okay, this is something I can really get my teeth into. So you start reading books like that, or uh, books that'll help you do that. And that just sinks into you, right? So I think it's really just being open to that and letting it happen. Yes. So to kind of expand on that question, you sure. mentioned research. About how often, like how much a day do you do research compared to like writing? Uh, you know, it depends. I, I like to do things in stretches. So for instance, when I'm writing, I pretty much just write. Mm -hmm. And I'll read in the evening or something like that for fun, but I, I pretty much just write. But also I like to layer my books together. So for instance, if I know I'm gonna be writing a book about uh, one subject here, I'll start reading about it while I'm writing another book, right? Okay. So uh, I'm just kind of you know, slowly doing the research, letting the ideas kind of percolate in the back of my brain. So by the time I sit down to write the actual book, I've got all the ideas and all the research already done, right? It doesn't always work out that way, but that's generally how I'd like to do it. Like about a character that already exists, like did you like pay a fee to the company that already made that? That's a good question. That's a, that's a common misconception, actually. Uh, the company, what usually happens is, again, the money flows toward the writer. 
Okay, so I don't pay a fee to do that, but what happens is somebody has paid a fee. Usually it's a large publisher that goes to the, what we call the intellectual property rights holder, the IP owner, right? And the IP owner, for instance, would say, hey, little novel that I wrote. Uh, some publisher, in this case it was Simon & Schuster, went up to Microsoft and said, we'd like to write Halo novels. We'd like to publish these. Uh, we will pay you a licensing fee for this, a large amount of money and then a royalty. Uh, and then you're gonna allow us to have the rights to publish that exclusively, right? For, uh, and they can break up those rights. They can say, okay, DK gets the rights to do encyclopedias or not non-fiction stuff about fictional stuff. Uh, Simon & Schuster actually gets the right to do new fiction in this world, right? And then we'll do comic books over here with Dark Horse. But in each case, it's the publisher that went out and lined those up ahead of time. Now what the publisher does is they turn around trying to find writers who are available and passionate enough to actually write in those worlds, right? So uh, I know a lot of people will start out writing fan fiction these days and then say, who do I have to pay so I can get my fan fiction published for real? And it, it almost never works that way. I, I can't remember thinking of anything that does. I've heard of stories like, uh, obviously the Fifty Shades of Grey was originally uh, fanfic for, what's the vampire series, I forget. Twilight. Twilight, thank you. Uh, that she then you know, filed the serial numbers off, she took the vampires out of a change, right? Um, but it's not a Twilight series then, it's her own thing theoretically, or at least you know, it is by the time she's done with it. So uh, I would never recommend trying to write a book and then selling it to a publisher like that. Uh, what normally happens is if somebody has the license, they will go out there and look for writers. You can put your hand up and say, yeah, I'd like that to be me, as soon as you figure out who owns the license. For instance, when the Halo novels were done, uh, I figured out that um, the license was transferred from Del Rey over to Simon & Schuster, and it was going to an editor I knew at Simon & Schuster that I had done a previous novel for, him. and I wrote him and said, Ed, I want to write Halo novels, because I've been playing this game for years, I play with my kids, um, and I know the guys a bunch, and blah, blah, blah. He's like, I was just writing you an email to ask if you would like to actually write one of these books. So it works out, right? Uh, now, if you want to get on that list, there's uh, two ways to do it. One is put your hand up, just out of the blue on Twitter or whatever else, or write the guy because you saw that they have, uh, they have a license. The other one is to have your agent, assuming that you have one, go ask the editor for you, right? And sometimes your agent will say, what kind of tie-in stuff, it's called tie-ins because they're tied into whatever original intellectual property it is. Uh, what kind of tie-ins are you interested in? They'll go out and find that stuff for you. If you're interested in doing Star Wars or Halo or Marvel or whatever else, right? I mean, My Little Pony. There's My Little Pony comics that are published by IDW, right? Um, so there's something out there for everybody. Now, the trick is that no editor is going to want to take a chance on you to write a tie-in novel if you haven't already written a novel, right? Because it's like anybody who says, I can run a marathon, honest. Look, I've walked around the block, right? I can walk, I can run a marathon. Technically, that's true. You probably you could, right? But the chances of you actually pulling it off without training and it's craft uh, build up are about zero. And they don't want to risk sending you, you know, thousands of dollars on the off chance that you're going to pull up, actually be able to pull this off when they can give those thousands of dollars to somebody who's already proven themselves. Right? So even if you don't have a published novel, if you have a trunk novel, something you published that's not or written that's not been published yet, you can show that and say, look, I've proven that I can do this, and that will help. We need to at least have that one part done. Actually, um, I've actually never written a novel in spec, right, which is when you write one ahead of time, because uh, I was working as a full-time game writer when I started writing novels, and I thought, okay, I'll just go over to the publishing arms of these companies, like Games Workshop and uh, Wizards of the Coast, and say, hey, I've been writing millions of words for you, let me write a novel for you. And they're like, yeah, but you haven't written a novel. And I'm like, well, shit, I don't know why I'm going to have time to just sit down and write. I had one I had written in college that was so awful, nobody's ever going to see it, right? I'm going to burn it whenever I can find it. Um, and uh, I, somebody at a game convention heard me whining about this in a bar and said, hey, Matt, I'll pay you to write a novel, right? It, uh, Reaper Miniatures, uh, they do all sorts of different things. Um, you know, these little metal soldiers, essentially. And Ed Pugh over Reaper Miniatures said, I'll pay you $5,000 to write a 40,000-word novel. Uh, based on our in our CAV universe, com combat assault vehicle, which is basically like Battletech or, or Robotech or Transformers or whatever, guys are big robots. Um, and I wrote it for him and I turned it over on time and he sent me a check without even looking at what I had written. Just that kind of a guy, right? Stand up guy. But then I was able to take that manuscript, turn it around and show it to Games Workshop and Wizards of the Coast, and then they hired me immediately to write novels. So, uh, but again, unless you get lucky enough to find that one guy who believes in you out of nowhere and, and hears you complaining about it somehow, that it's probably not gonna happen. So write your own novel, 
And the best part about that is if you write your own novel, even if you don't get that tie-in gig you wanted, you have your own novel, right? And then you can try to shop that around. Another bit of advice that kind of goes along with that is if you write your first novel and you're shopping around with an agent, don't stop there. Go write your next novel, right? Or your third novel, or your fourth novel, or whatever. Because if that agent sells that novel, uh, what's gonna happen is the editor will turn around to you eventually and say, do you have anything else? And you're gonna say, oh yeah, look, I have a whole bunch of things right here for you, right? Um, so it's, and plus the other thing is, most times your first novel sucks, right? The first time you do anything, it sucks. First time you pick up a guitar, you sound horrible, right? Not even your parents would tell you you were good. So you know, if you write that first novel, allow it to suck, it's fine. You're gonna learn so many things as you write that novel. Keep writing, write your second one, write your third one, and then what will often happen is if you get back and the editor says, do you have anything else, you'll say, yeah, I, oh, hold on a minute, I need to look at this, because I know now, having learned all this stuff, that these suck. Or the editor will say, these are okay, but I'd like you to change these things so that they suck less. That, there's two, a number of different ways it can go. If it's a novelization of something that already exists, like if you're writing a novelization of a Star Wars film, the plot and the characters and everything else has already been done. You're just taking a script and then turning it into a novel. So that, obviously, you don't get to come up with anything on your own. Uh, when you're writing stuff that's more independent, like the Halo novels I wrote, or the Dungeons and Dragons novels I wrote, or the Blood Bowl novels, uh, often they'll say, pitch me an idea. So for instance, the Halo novels, they said, can you come up with three to five different ideas of say, a couple paragraphs each? And they said, here's a freebie for you, here's a softball, we'll let you have this one, because we're kind of interested in something like this. But don't let that limit you, if you want to do something else, feel free, pitch us whatever you want. And so I usually come up with three to five ones and they're very short because I don't like to waste a lot of time in these things. And, because there's all sorts of different ways that something can go wrong. If uh, I pitch them an idea for this great book, there are probably 16 ways that it could go wrong that I couldn't possibly know about because of plans they got for other things or other books in the works or other games in the works or comics or films or whatever. So rather than spend you know a week on each one of these ideas, I spend a couple hours on each one of these ideas, come up with a nice tight paragraph or two. And then if they need to uh, blast it away, they blast it away and I don't feel bad. On the other hand, if they like it, what they do is they say, oh, we like this one and this one. Can you develop those into like two pages each? And I do that, and they're like, okay, we like this one best, can you give us an outline? So you write an outline, you know, based upon how many chapters and pages you think it's gonna be. And then they say, okay, this all looks good, here's your contract, and go. Right. Can you demonstrate one of those pitches from maybe a pre-existing or a book that's been written? Can you like summarize what, what a pitch would sound like? Uh, pitches can be a lot of different things. Like uh, the first Halo novel I wrote, because that's an easy one, uh, was called Halo Bad Blood. It didn't even have that title when I wrote it. I can't remember what the original title was. But uh, I looked at the different things they had, and they were kind of pushing me to do uh, this one book I was not very excited about. And then they said, I said, but there's this game called Halo 3 ODST, which I really liked. It was one of the series that's kind of like this bastard child in the series. It's got this noirish feel to it. It's got underpowered characters. And, but the neat part is like, uh, the main characters played by Nathan Fillion, and half the cast of Fireflies in there, and I really like the voice work. I like the plot and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, what I want to do is write a sequel to Halo, to Halo 3 ODST, talk about what happens to them after the, uh, the events in that game, how it all goes up, and they're like, oh, and they couldn't even tell me this but uh, at the time when I was pitching this, but I learned later that uh, Buck, who's the main character there, played by Fillion, uh, ends up being one of the main characters in Halo 5. And I was writing this before Halo 5 had been announced at this point. So uh, they're like, oh, this is great, because then we can take this, it'll tie in with this, we can run off with that. So, uh, so I just basically wrote a paragraph saying, I love these characters, I'd like to do more about them, here's some ideas for this. Uh, and then we went off after that. And part of the discussion after that was, okay, here are the characters, here, here's one guy you can't kill, you can kill anybody else you want to, right? Um, and I killed off a major character in the game, from, from the game in the books, I still get shit about it all the time. And that's one of the other things, is people get really attached to these characters. I've got a friend, uh, Bob Salvatore, R.E. Salvatore, as people call him, he writes, uh, Forgotten Realms novels, and he writes Star Wars novels, and all sorts of other good stuff. Uh, but Bob was the guy who killed off Chewbacca in the novels, right? And this was at George Lucas's request. George had come up with this idea, and he said, I think Bob's the right guy to write it, it's all gonna happen. And Bob gets death threats to this day about the fact that he killed off Chewbacca by dropping a moon on him, right? It was like, nothing you're ever gonna escape, we all know he's dead. Um, and it was a good fitting ending for this epic character. But because you killed off everybody's you know, favorite giant teddy bear, 
uh, he still gets people, you know, literally he's telling me he has to go die on a daily basis. So if you want to talk about what's the worst part about being a writer, sometimes it's fan reaction. Like that. I don't really think he let it get to you, but uh, some fans are better than others, you're more understanding of I mean, at the end of the day, it's all fiction stories, right? It's not, nobody really died. How much is real life inspiration for what you write then in your fiction? Well, I mean, a lot of the stuff I write is, is uh, science fiction and fantasy, right? So, um, I think when you do any kind of writing, you draw upon your own life experiences and how you think the world works, right? Uh, how cynical you are, how optimistic you are, or, or whatever else, I think that comes out in your fiction. I think, it, uh, I think in some ways you can't even help that. You just, as you write, if something rings true to you, it's because that's how you believe things are. That's how you believe people are to each other, how people work. Sometimes it's optimistic and you think, this is how people should work. And sometimes you're being cynical and you're thinking, well, but this is actually how they work and it's horrible. Right? So in that sense, you, you strip mine your entire life for everything you ever write. Uh, the interactions that two characters will have between each other are probably secretly your parents fighting in the kitchen. You know, uh, Things like that. It's just all going to come out at some point or another. And you try not to hurt the people you like too much. <laughs> other than that, I wrote a novel when I was in college. I had a, it was a time travel novel. Uh, where the protagonist kills his father over and over, and I showed it to my dad. I'm like, oh yeah, I was probably working out some issues then. Yeah? Um, <laughs> and we had a laugh over it. Yeah. But um, you know, any kind of writing you do like that is, is based upon uh, things that have happened in your own life. I'm writing right now a, uh, a contemporary thriller, and of course that's a little bit more grounded in reality. Um, so I'm doing a lot more research for that one because, I mean, if, if I get some detail wrong in a dragon, nobody can tell me I'm wrong. But if I get something wrong about a drone pilot working in Las Vegas, people can tell me I'm wrong, right? They can say, no, no, my buddy did that, or I did that, or whatever, and that's screwed up. So I try to get the details right for that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. for that, I actually will go, if I get a chance to talk to people who've had similar kinds of experiences. Thank you. Well, um, get the experience first and then write about it, essentially. That is actually true to a certain extent. I mean, one thing is you can research anything. I mean, people say, write what you know, the other, the corollary of that, the flip side, is to know what you write. You can go out and research, especially nowadays when you have the infinite information machine in your pocket. Right? You can literally tap into all the knowledge that's out there in the world at a moment's notice. Um, so you can actually go out and do the research and figure things out. But I do think there's something about going out there and learning about what the world's like. Uh, when I was graduating from college, I, uh, my creative writing professor was also my guidance counselor in college. And I said, uh, Warren, do I go on for a master's? Do I go on to get a doctor? Do I go on to get, get another degree? He says, I recommend you go out and live life for a while so you have something to write about, right? So that's essentially what you're saying there. And I, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think it's, it's uh, as you're growing up, I mean, some, we all have different experiences, right? But I think travel especially really broadens the mind. I mean, it's, uh, you get out there and you see different cultures and you see how different we are from each other. And the more places I've been, the more differences I've seen, the more I realize we're all more like each other than we actually, a lot of us care to admit. Right. I mean, I'm working on uh, video games has brought me all around the world. I've been uh, Kenya last year, Shanghai, Singapore, Sweden, lots and lots of different places. Um, and I think just, again, as you, as you travel, that exposes you to those different cultures. And it's neat to come back to your own culture then and see it from a different point of view, right? And to see what other people think about your culture as you go. So I recommend getting out there and seeing the world a bit. It's really up to you, and obviously not everybody has the wherewithal to travel, right? It's not like you just say, screw it, I'm gonna uh, take a round the world trip for a year and survive on what, right? But I also think when you're young and, and foolish and don't have a whole lot of expenses, don't have a mortgage and kids in a car and all that kind of stuff, that's a great time to take a bit of a risk if you can manage it, right? Um, like, when I came back from being- Although, workshop, when, I, you, when you have a mortgage and kids and a house, you might be motivated to leave. Yeah. On a going to a- <laughs> you might be more made to believe, but only, you know, some people... It will be harder. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think it's a lot more complicated to leave people behind if you have those kind of responsibilities, right? But when you don't have responsibilities, that's when it's time to go out there and take, you know, dive in the deep end, take a chance, right? Um, I know a lot of people would like to be able to do that when they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. What happens is you get to a certain point where you get a midlife crisis. You look back and you say, I, I wanted this to do this. I wanted to live my dreams here, but I've been playing it safe the entire time and I never got around to doing that. And now I hate myself and my choices for that. So now I want to break out and do these other things. Right? This, this is a common story. You see, it's as, practically as common as uh, Joseph Campbell's stuff. Right? It's just, uh, 
every, every <laughs> so many stories are written this way. My life, I basically engineered to not have a midlife crisis. My father said I had a quarter life crisis when I was in college, essentially. Right? Um, but just try not to hate yourself as you get older. But I think just jump in and do what you can while you're young. Because again, uh, this is the time where if you screw it up, you might make a mistake that's going to be, oh, put you $10,000 in debt. Right? Whereas if you screw it up in your, when you're 40 or 50 or 60, it could be something that puts you, ten, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Or screw up everything else that you're doing too with your family and, and children and grandchildren or whatever you have to so you guys are young. Do it now while you can. Right? I mean, uh, I think my first year of freelance, I made like four thousand dollars, and I was living in a really cheap place. And my girlfriend got my rent for my birthday and Christmas. Right? So uh, again, I married her because that was the right lady in a lot of ways. But um, what what was the most successful year you've had as a writer? Uh, actually, the funny part is the most successful year I had was writing for toys. Right. Toys are crazy money. I've done uh, work for a company called Playmates Toys, which owns uh, the rights to Star Trek toys and um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. Uh, but the money that goes into a toy that goes onto a shelf, if you see it in uh, Toys R Us or Walmart or whatever else, Toys R Us is gone. If you see it on Walmart, Target, whatever else, uh, it's a three to five million dollar marketing budget just for that toy, just for the ads, right? So anything they're paying me is really a rounding error on their marketing budget. Um, so I can ask them for the sky. Yeah, I'll ask them for the stars, they give me the sky and I'm pretty happy. Right. Um, so those have been pretty good years. Other years, again, games have done very well for me in the past. I did a collectible card game for a guy named Jim Lee back when he was running a company, Wildstrom, which was part of Image Comics. And uh, we made enough money that year to save the company from bankruptcy, which was great. And Jim is now the co-publisher of DC Comics. and. Uh, the guy who I was working with is vice president there at the time is now the publisher of Marvel Comics. Right, so, uh, in fact, I just talked to John on the phone two days ago. So. Is being writer one of those professions where you can stay and live wherever you want? Uh, yeah, you can. In fact, uh, one of the neat things about freelance writing nowadays is that you can live wherever you want. Nobody cares where you are. If you want to be a TV writer, you probably got to move to California to Los Angeles area, right? Uh, you don't have to, but it's a lot easier if you do. Uh, I know a guy named Saladin Ahmed who writes a lot of neat books, and he's currently doing the fly back and forth between LA and Detroit thing. Uh, but the, he's, he's a rare fellow to be able to pull that off. And he had a reputation writing some amazing books and comics before he ended up doing that. Um, but for just about any other kind of writing, they don't care where you live, right? If they need you, they can fly you out someplace for a little bit and then send you back home. Sometimes for writing for video games, you might need to be in-house as well too. But that's more of a newer kind of thing over the last 10 years. Um, hold on one second. And, uh, but I mean, one of the neat things about, one of the reasons I live in this area is I get paid the same as a freelancer no matter where I live, right? So here, I can live in a nice house, on an acre of land, and have my kids go to good schools and all that kind of stuff. But if I lived in San Francisco, I would be in a closet, right? Uh, just because the cost of living is so much higher. Yes? Um, so, is writing books easier for you, or is it like creating games? They're both, they both inch different parts of my craft and story. And so because of that, I like, I like working on them because they, they get your whole brain going at once. Stories don't really do that. They really focus on the, on the right-hand side of your brain, the creative side. And because of that, it's a little, it's not less challenging, it's just a different kind of challenge, right? Uh, but you know, having done a couple decades of writing uh, role-playing game material where you're basically coming up with an entire world and adventures for other people to tell stories with, it's kind of wild to then take the reins and just say, okay, this is my way to tell you the best version of that story. So a lot of my stuff has got very strong world building in it because that's pretty much what I cut my teeth on while I was doing these role playing games. Okay, well, go ahead. Here. When it came to um, deciding, because I noticed you had a lot of e-books versus um, hardcover, softcover. Yeah. When it came to deciding what to do for those, how did you go about publishing them? Well, um, when I published, uh, there's, Two different types of writers nowadays, right? You have self-published writers and you have published writers. Published writers are people that are published by uh, by other people, usually large publishing houses if you're lucky, but also sometimes small publishers. They make those choices for you of how to publish the books, right? If you're self-publishing, a lot of times, and I do a little bit of both. I'm what they call a hybrid author, right? If you're self-publishing, it's up to you what you want to do, right? The easiest way to self-publish a book is to release an ebook. Because you don't have to worry about paying for printing, you don't have to worry about distribution, all that kind of stuff. And honestly, as a self-publisher, the chance of you getting your book into a store 
is almost zero. Unless you actually have a relationship with the storekeeper and can go over and say, hey buddy, can you put my book in here uh, as a commission kind of a sale? And please sell it and we'll do a book party and all this kind of stuff. But uh, the chances of you getting your books in a nationwide blowout through Barnes and Noble or something, zip. No, never happens, right? Um, so if, if it's important to you to get your book on a store shelf, to actually have a physical copy on a store shelf across the country, you need to go with a large publisher, right? If it's if you just want to get your story out there, you can release an ebook, and it uh, it costs you to hire an editor, get a cover done, uh, format it properly, all that kind of stuff. But it's not that much money. I mean, you're going to spend more time on it doing the actual labor yourself for the for the writing than you'll than anybody else will do anything else. Um, so you can, pu you can publish an ebook for fairly cheaply, especially once you know what you're doing. Right? Um, I had a crazy challenge I did in 2012 called 12 for 12. Right, wrote 12 novels in the year. I wrote a novel every month. They were uh, 50,000 words each, and I paid for them by running Kickstarters. I wrote them, broke them up into th four trilogies and uh, ran a Kickstarter for each one of them. And those are all self-published books, right? So um, those I put out just mostly as e-books, but also did print-on-demand copies for the people who backed it. And some people backed it at higher amounts, so I give them hardcovers or omnibuses or autographs or whatever else they wanted if they were willing to pay more of them. 